Hello, my name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode 16 of Antidote. Few albums are as legendary as Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. It was going to be the 11th album by the veteran band who had already undergone a great deal of change. By the time it was finished, it would change the lives of the band and of the man who is with us today. He is the co-producer of Rumors. His name is Ken Calais. Ken, welcome to Antidote. Hey, Michael, thanks. This is Ken's book that I finished reading last night. This is Making Rumors. And Ken, when I was reading this, it was a fast read. Like many other Americans and people throughout the world, I've listened to this record hundreds, if not thousands of times. I remember the day I bought it. Uh, I believe in some of the notes that I read about the book, I think you said that it took you four months to research and three months to, to write. One of the things that blew me away about the book was just how detailed it was and how much you could remember from those sessions. I, I was surprised about that. I made it all up. As you do. No, you know, it, it, it was great. Um, when I did the research, as I was saying, I went back to the tape vaults because Warner's has a great collection of all the tapes. And in the tape vaults uh, are these, uh, t the tape logs mm -hmm. that tell exactly when we did what. And I had really good assistant engineers who would take a lot of right notes. So we did John McBee's Olympic bass on you know, February 16th, and then on then March something else, we did the organ. And so I had all these notes, and I just put them into a big calendar. Mm -hmm. I originally called this the book uh, Rumors Diaries, because I put together the calendar of when I, moved, when I drove up there, and, and then I overlaid it to birthdays and things that I could remember what we did then, and mm -hmm. then I laid that in uh, like it snowed when we were up in Sausalito and one day, so, and it was rarely, very rare for it to, to snow, so I put that in the calendar, and then by putting all that stuff in, I could pretty much re remember a lot of the things, and other stuff, we, it was typical conversations that we've had with Fleetwood, so. Mm -hmm. I, tried to, I tried to make it feel like, exactly like what it felt like for me to be in the room, because I really wanted people to understand what a big time record feels like. It's, it's not what you see on TV, you know, it's, it's a bunch of people working hard. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, this album is one of those albums, it's almost like The Godfather or something. It's, it's part of the cultural landscape. Everybody's, everybody's heard it. Most people like it. Most people have seen behind the music or classic album episodes on VH1 about it. Everybody's heard the legends. So when I was reading your book, um, it was just interesting to me, to like, you know what, I'm getting it straight from the horse's mouth. Here, here's how it really went down. And you mentioned that drive to Sausalito. In the first chapter, you talk about, you moved out here to LA. You immediately, you're a super hard worker. You immediately set about getting a job. You landed a job, I believe, at Wally Hyder Studios. Right. And you mentioned him as your mentor. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you got to work really, really fast. And one of the things that amused me you kind of make this quick toss off, like, oh yeah, you know, I'm doing some strings for Band on the Run and Paul McCartney dropped down. I mean, that's huge. And uh, yeah. you were, you, you jumped right into the deep end. Well, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was just young. I was, you know, I was ready to go. I, I loved what I was doing. I moved here as I think, as I wrote in the book, that I had been playing guitar and, mm -hmm. and I came down I, to, I followed my girlfriend down here, and I thought I'd get a job in a recording studio. Figured I'd work, you know, at night when I wasn't working, I'd go record myself and, and you know, sell a million records, and that'd be it. Of course. And then the first day, the first session I did was with uh, Crosby, Stills, and Ash. And I looked at that, and I realized how pathetic I was. You know, I, I was never going to be a, a, a superstar. I, I mean. You know, I was I was this, and they were gigantic. So, so but suddenly I fell in love with the console, the thing mm -hmm. you know that all the uh, dial switches and knobs. So, and I really just kind of moved into this passion of making music and making the music sound as good as possible. So that was that was really how I got started working with uh, Fleetwood Mac. I they gave me the opportunity of making the best sound on on every instrument, making it sound as good as possible. And like I, they'd let me spend hours, you know, working on a guitar part or a keyboard part, and we'd be messing with strings, changing strings, or putting different effects on, changing amps, trying different direct boxes, you know, other mm -hmm. technical things. So they were thrilled with that. 
and letting them making their. I, I, I told them the first day. I said, "We're going to get a Grammy on the, for this record." We're going to return to that because, as we see right here, uh, your partner to co-produce this record was Richard Dashett. Right. But you, when you first met him, and just a couple of weeks before you would go to Sausalito to start work on uh, Rumors, you had never heard of Fleetwood Mac. Right. And so Richard walks in, uh, and I guess that you have just gotten the gig to mix an hour for the uh, King Biscuit Flower, Power, Flower Hour. Right. Um, and it was a live show that Fleetwood Mac had done. So you were going to mix that, and uh, you and he became fast friends. And one of you asked the other one, as you do, want to get high. And uh, you guys got high, proceeded to work, became yeah. friends. And 11, 11 o'clock on Saturday morning, I recall. Gorgeous day, and we uh, that's what I had to do on Saturday, make, make music, so. Well, the band was very pleased with your work mm -hmm. on that, and I believe they brought in someone else to continue some work. He didn't get the gig because he was trying to use flying faders, and it surprised me. I didn't even think that existed at 76. I didn't know that they already had they, consoles with flying faders, which is motorized gear. I don't think they were flying faders, but they were computerized. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had the little light you'd have to match okay. the, the LED light. And this guy, that uh, he, had, he had already been hired to do the album, um, and the, the Rumors album, yeah. but I just was got hired to do this radio show. Yeah. But the radio show was all the songs from their previous album, um, which was what he was supposed to be actually mixing to get, it, get the, the job. Mm -hmm. But I had, there was no pressure on me. It was just a radio show. It was yeah. Saturday morning. And, so I was just so comfortable and relaxed in my own studio that I work at all the time doing what I do um, that it came out really good. The next day they went, it was so Sunday, they went over to work with him to actually remix the single, the Rhiannon single. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I guess in comparison, he was, he was nervous. Yeah. They were nervous. Uh, they were on, on his ass and they were kind of going, what's going on? You know, why, you know, why are you... Why does, wasn't it coming out so good? So they didn't, he didn't get the gig. They called me back Monday morning and said, can you come in and mix the single, Rhiannon? So I did, same thing, you know, just did it just like I did it. And, and Stevie's dancing and twirling. And I remember one time she said, can, can you put a little more fairy dust in my vocal? I said, sure, Stevie. And you know, turn the imaginary knob. You can't turn down Stevie Nicks. No. Fairy dust, we've got as much as you want. Um, so, so the band was pleased with your work. Uh, Mick speaks with Richard Dashett, says that he's going to get to make the record. Richard says, well, I want to bring Ken. They're all agreeable to that. Next thing you know, you are driving to Sausalito with your dog Scooter. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we could bring up the record plant. Oh, here we have it. Um, so this all transpires over a two-week period. So two weeks ago, you didn't really know who Fleetwood Mac was. Now you're driving to the studio to, uh, to work on the record. Yep, to, to live with some musicians. And I thought this has got to be weird. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I knew a little bit about musicians and I know they're unconventional and they're children. Yes. They're, you know. So I thought, well, Scooter, it's you and me, buddy. We're going to stick together. Well, you guys went up there and um, you mentioned in the book you were, you were more the, the hands-on technical guy and Dash was kind of their psychotherapist to a certain extent. Um, because the band, everybody knows the legend of rumors, which is, you know, the couples were breaking up. Um, so that, that, that was on. And um, he was, he, I guess, had l allowed Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks to live with him for a little while in L.A. Right. And, and he was their live sound mixer. Yes. Okay. So Richard had a history with them. Uh, he actually picked them up when they were hitchhiking one day. And, and, uh, and they were so broke, Lindsay and Stevie. In fact, Stevie in the Tusk album, a couple of the songs start when she says, I don't want to be poor anymore. I don't want to be a cleaning lady. And which is, that's what she did. She cleaned people's houses. She worked at Copper Penny and delis in, around LA. And they used to write uh, bad checks and, uh, to get breakfast. No kidding. So they were so poor and they, they all lived with, uh, with Richard in his house. He worked at, a, at Sound City where mm -hmm. they did the, the, the previous album. Yeah. And so that was perfect. Eventually they started getting to know the owners of Sound City and they started, she started cleaning his house for free studio time. So, but yeah, so 
Richard was really close with the band, and then when when so he was kind of like my go-between, you know, my mm -hmm. interface to to them, and uh, it was. I mean, it couldn't have been more comfortable, you know. And and the thing I that after when I was researching and writing the book, people that were there in the studio said, "This Calais, he's just the luckiest guy in the world. Can you believe that he got this gig, this gigantic gig?" And, and it was like, it just it didn't feel like that at all. It felt like you and me just doing something, you know. It's just we were making this record. So, for. Ladies and gentlemen, he, he was 29 years old. He had been working at Wally Hyder, as we, we discussed, and so he gets the gig very quickly because they were pleased with his work, and Richard asked him to come along. So, but you, I mean, you got the gig on your own merit. I mean, they, sure. they wanted you there. They, they liked your work. But what's amazing to me is you were 29, and you'd only been in this town for, what, five years or five something years, at yeah, that point? I'd been working at Hyder's for five years. Yeah, so, so you get up to Sausalito, um, and the record plant, okay, so the Grateful Dead had worked there. They did uh, the Flood album there. Um, I guess Songs in the Key of Life, some of it had been done there. Um, it was a, it was a well-known studio. And what I, I don't remember if you mentioned this in the book, but how come them to pick that particular studio? Was it just so we could get out of L.A. or? Precisely. Yeah. Well, Sausalito is the kind of hippie vibe that seems appropriate. I mean, look at the front doors that was appropriate mm -hmm. to this this type of record. Yeah, they, you know, when, when we spent four months at the record plant, and then we went back down to L.A. to yes. to work down there. And I realized immediately that the first day we were back, attorneys were dropping by, the record company was coming by, friends were dropping by, we couldn't get anything done. So, you know, I immediately appreciated the fact that we had this solitude up here in beautiful Sausalito. Well, um, listen, I, one thing that I know everybody wants to know about, because um, I want to talk about some of the songs, I want to talk about what ended up happening with the record, but when people think about Fleetwood Mac, of course, they think of, you know, they think of the couples, they think of the marital, uh, the, 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 the relationships going awry, they think about cocaine. And, um, what I was surprised about, and I don't know if this is because I'm a jaded person or something, but actually, there was not as much cocaine as I expected. I mean, you're very open about the cocaine use in the studio, but I actually, and maybe this came later, or maybe you're being a cool it guy. It came later. No, no, it came later. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the impression that I got, because um, when I mentioned that you were going to be on this show, I have a lot of musician friends. Um, I put out to Facebook, hey, you know, Ken Calais coming on the show on Monday. What are your big Fleetwood Mac questions? Because I wanted to hear what people said, because I knew I had a lot of friends out there who loved Fleetwood Mac. And one of them was, you know, was the cocaine use overt or was it a behind the scene thing? And, and you make it very clear in, in the book that, you know, there was a bag of cocaine and, and occasionally it came out and people used it. Right, it was a basically a, a group bag. Yes. Right, which when when it gets to be chronic usage, everybody has their own. Right, and it's or, hidden away. Right, exactly. Keep your hands off. That was mine. Tusk. Uh, that was Tusk was completely crazy coke. Yeah. But and rumors it was just kind of used as an alternative for uh, coffee. Sure. At least in my opinion. Yep. And, and I was I was the engineer, so I had to run the buttons and you know do everything so I couldn't get as messed up as other people could yeah um, so but as I said we we had a community bag of coke on the console so yeah. you know they would hey anybody want to so okay we bring it out to us and they you know so that's just that's not happened that never happened so right. I always say when the band says well yeah we were uh, that was a crazy time it it, it was beginnings of the crazy time mm -hmm. you know they were just learning how to use it and how to control it and everything else yeah. and, so it wasn't really crazy at all. Yeah. Well, that's the feeling that I got because I think that the popular legend is that, wow, they were just completely coked out and everything, but still managed to make this beautiful album um, rich with, there's no gimmicks on this album. It's a rich album. I think one of the reasons it's so popular is it's so real. Um, I think there are a lot of gimmicks on the record. Y'all really hit me. Well, I mean, I just, if you want to call gimmicks, we have a lot of microphone tricks and yeah. equipment tricks and making, you know, tape delays on guitars and things that actually create, help to create the sound. I, I follow you. Yeah. I, I didn't mean, it, that's, I guess it's the wrong word, but um, I mean, I guess 
what I get from the record is it feels like a real record. It feels like people who are being honest in their songwriting. Mm -hmm. And it was honest in the way you guys recorded it. It felt like. Yeah, definitely. You know, and, and every song was written in the studio, yeah. it written right in front of me. So I saw songs born right there. And then everybody, like Stevie, well, had a room, um, a Sly Stone's studio. The pit. Was a, yeah, the pit, down the, down the hall. And she could go in there because she didn't have that much to do. You know, she wasn't a full-time musician. So she would go and write songs. And she came busting into the room with, with, and says, I just wrote the best song I've ever written. She says, you got to hear it. And we had just finished a recording something else. And so she sat down. And of course, we always have everything ready to go as part of my policy. I have a piano in the, in the control room. So you know, if there's an idea, you, we get it. We capture it. Mm -hmm. So she started playing on the, the, the on dreams. And immediately, everybody's going, yeah, yeah, that's good. And Lindsay tells his ro uh, roadie to bring his acoustic guitar in. John tells his roadie to bring the, his bass in. And, and Mick starts tapping on the table. And right there in the control room, they're kind of working out the tempo and the key and everything else of the song. And then out to the studio, and we recorded. But you know, so every song was written out of really tears, because yes. almost every song is written about the breakups that each, all the band members were breaking up. These days, I mean, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I mean, this record took a year to make, almost a year to make, because you started on it in February of 76, and I don't remember what the release date was right off the bat, but it took you almost a year to make it. And you're mentioning right now that the songs were largely written in the studio. These days, you know, a, a guy does a lot of work on a computer at home. I mean, and I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of thinking about a band in a studio, working together, making a record. I have a romantic notion of that as opposed to one dude sitting... And no time limit. I mean, does that even exist anymore? Mm -hmm. I saw Stevie a couple years ago, and she was uh, doing her new album. And she says, Ken, do you know they gave me 13 days to do this record? 13 days. She says, can you believe it? And we had 365 days, yep. or more if we needed them. Nobody was, nobody was on, our, on, on our butts or on our heels or anything pushing us. Well, another thing that interests me is these days when, it, when a pop record comes out, and it's almost a joke, it's like it, in this particular record, Lindsay would write the songs, or Christine would write the songs, or Stevie would write the songs. There was only one song on the album that had everyone listed as a co-writer. These days, you look at a typical pop hit, and it's got like six producers who you may or may not have ever heard of, and I just pictured them all at a Mac at, in different places in an office, you know, okay, well, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do this. And at the very end, the singer comes in and sings over it. And I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't, it seems like just a completely different animal and not it, as much you know, fun. It is. It, it, it's, you know, and the, the, with Rumors, we had the unusual circumstance of the previous album, the, the White Album. Yeah. Uh, which had Rhiannon and, yes. and Over My Head on it, um, still climbing the charts when we were over halfway done with the record. The, whole, the record didn't actually hit number one, the previous record, until August. We started in, in January. So we had almost eight months into the record before the previous record hit the top of the charts. So we had this, I like to call it kind of a, a, an umbrella, mm -hmm. or prote a prote which protected us from the, a shield from the labels. The labels weren't even worried about what, how much we were spending because their previous record was doing so well, we mm -hmm. could do no wrong. They were just doing cartwheels. So when, when you start doing rumors and you, you have that kind of success, I think at the time it sold 15 or 20 million records. There was, nobody was going to question how long we were going to be in the studio for Tusk at all. Mm -hmm. you know, so where Stevie, you know, she, she knows she's not selling as much on that 13 days. She, they had somebody had to do the math on it. Well, it's you know how much can we really afford to go? Because she's not selling that many sure. records. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, every things have just changed so much. But at this point in the '70s, I mean, this is still this is still the golden days, man. This is mm -hmm. when rock and roll is king. And correct me if you're wrong, but I, I've made this comment to friends of mine that music fills a different place in the cultural landscape, I think, now than it used to. Because when I think of the 60s and 70s, 
in my opinion, or at least my, my vantage point, music was the top of the pyramid. Film stars, uh, fashion designers, everybody followed musicians for, for what are they wearing? What are they into? What are they about? And then they would kind of take notes from that. These days, you know, I think it's more about creating software, <laughs> video games, or what have you. But at that point in the 70s and even in the 80s, I think that music was the tip of the spear for what was cool. It was a great time. I'm, I remember down at the, the Troubadour, we used to go down there, yeah. and the Glenn Fry would be sitting there. Yeah. Linda Ronstadt would be sitting at the bar. And I mean, it was just, there were so many fewer, so many fewer cars than, than uh, ever. I, we could walk across the street at Wally Hyder's and never have to worry about it. Now, now it's literally so packed, I'm, I'm amazed at how many more people are here. And the business has changed so much. Big time. Um, I, I know people want to know about the record. So I, we'll talk about a couple songs. Um, you mentioned Dreams earlier. And here again, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think if somebody were to picture in their mind a stereotypical Fleetwood Mac sound, I, I would say it's, it's maybe the Dreams kind of sound, where Lynn, uh, Stevie singing, you know, uh, Mick and, and John are doing that, dun, 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 you know, because they were a great uh, rhythm team together. Lindsay's guitars were spacey. I would say that that's kind of the first type of sound that people might conjure in their heads when they think about Fleetwood Mac. Yep, definitely. I mean, we had that, that vibey three chord uh, uh, keyboard that yeah. the CB was playing. We had a, uh, we purposely recorded the drums. Uh, uh, we actually had created a drum loop. To, so, because we realized after trying the drums a few times that the song was almost monotonous. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if we did it right, and you could almost hypnotize people. Mm -hmm. So we cut this drum loop that was just a drum loop is you know the same four bars of a dr of a of a drum beat just yeah. played over again. So it's not varying at all. It's just constantly. I mean, just constantly. You could. We actually put a little a phaser on a mm -hmm. hi hat, so kind of the hi hat was kind of going. Ch -ch 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 you know, just trying to nod everybody to sleep. And then Lindsay's guitars were through an amp and then through this a Leslie, mm -hmm. the spinning Leslie, which is part of the Hammond B3. So the Leslie is spinning and rotating, and so the guitars kind of go wah, 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 and the way Lindsay plays his notes. So it was this whole vibey feel. It's a great sound. Um, my actual favorite song off the album, um, and every time I hear it, I crank it up. I go, go your own way is like, it just jams, man. I mean, I, I hear it on the radio. Like, I can't help it. I've got to turn the radio up. It's such a rock and roll song. The Chain, I like a lot as well. Uh, Goldust Woman, I, I'm very much drawn to the dark side of Fleetwood Mac, the moody side. And um, I thought that about you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, that's absolutely what I relate to. And the interesting thing about Fleetwood Mac, ladies and gentlemen, if you are only aware of the the Stevie and Lindsay period is this was a band that was going on their own. This was going to be their 11th album. There had already been previous uh, versions of the band. They started out as an English blues band. Um, Peter Green, Green Manalishi, uh, then uh, Bob Welch. And I saw Bob Welch play back in the day. Bob Weston. Um, yeah, and so this this was a band. This was the third kind of iteration of this band. And to their At credit. Least Jeremy Spencer was in there. He had a lot of people. I mean, basically, it was Fleetwood Mac, named by named for the rhythm section. Yes, John and John and Mick, who didn't write songs, which is interesting. So all they did is play bass and rhythm. So they needed a front man. Yeah, was Jeremy Spencer, Peter Green, and different people. Bob yep. Welsh, who would come up and and sing the songs and write the songs, and and uh, uh, so yeah, for for eleven years, Christine then Christine joined the band. She married John. For eleven years, they were doing. Uh, blues, or mm -hmm. I guess 11 albums. They were doing these blues, and, and the, the, they kidded the Stevie and Lindsay because they said they were boozers, right? They, they the, the British, the Brits, like we're hard drinkers, you know, yeah. and, and you hippies, you know, you go out there and smoke a, smoke a joint and look at a tree. Right. So it was interesting that the blues m met the, the California folk. Yes. Folk, they're really, at the, the time when they started, they were folk folk musicians playing really folky music. If you, if you listen to Buckingham Nicks. Absolutely. It's very folky, very uh, organic. And then I don't think at the time that, that uh, I know that, that during the White Album, Lindsay and Stevie didn't know what they had, what they could do with their music. If they had a powerful 
rhythm section. So when they actually started touring on the, for the White Album, like Lindsay had a song called "So Afraid," which mm -hmm. was very acoustic on the on the the White Album. But while they were touring, Mick would start to hit the drums harder, and then Lindsay would accent with a guitar back, and they'd kind of go back and forth. And this thing became this gigantic, as Lindsay called it, an 800 pound gorilla. So afraid was live. So by the time they got to rumors, they were just going, huh, you know, we have something more here that we have an untapped resource that they wanted to stick their toe in the water. So when Lindsay started playing Go Your Own Way on the day of the studio, he played it actually surprisingly enough on an acoustic guitar. Yep. You know, and it was just jing, 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 jing. And he was, I remember he was playing it so hard. His his neck, his veins, his neck were coming out. He was just so you can go your own way. It was like I was going, but why an acoustic guitar? That's, that doesn't make sense. But I thought it was a horrible song at that time, but it was unfinished. It mm -hmm. was you know, it was like a small cake with no frosting. You know? Sure. Well, it was an interesting song because the the, the guitar is doing one thing, the drums are doing something other, something else, and then when the chorus comes in, it's very strong. But. Um, I think about bands of that era, and a lot of people like to bag on the Eagles. You know, ever ever since Lebowski came out, it's very easy to say you hate the Eagles. And listen, I'm not an Eagles hater, um, but the difference to me, just as a as a fan listening, is they shared the same era, and they were both kind of California sound. But when I listen to Fleetwood Mac and Rumors, they're a bit more eccentric which I think is quite cool. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Eagles were eccentric as well, and there was some shared um, icono iconography of cocaine and the dark side of the business and everything. But the way you guys made this record, it was just a, I think it stands up a little better. And it, it's sparse, it's psychedelic, it's kind of punky at times. I can go your own way with these crazy guitars we're talking about. And then you do the dissonant thing in Goldust Woman. It's just a very eccentric, beautiful thing. It was almost a selfish record, I think, in some ways, you know? I mean, they, everybody did what they wanted to do. There was no outside influences, really. We just did what we wanted. We would pop up a tape, and uh, we'd walk into the studio, and what do you want to do today? Um, I don't know, let's, let's pull up uh, Goldust and, and see if we can work on that. And, and so we'd do that, and then we'd put that one away, and we'd... Well, let's pull up dreams and see what else. And Chris, Chris might go. I'm gonna think. I'm gonna play an organ here. Okay, that's good. So then we'd set up for the organ, and then she'd record the organ, and then, okay, that's enough. You know, or maybe we'll do a little background work, and then let's go to another song. So we would, we wouldn't get too tired on any song. We wouldn't just beat it to death and finish it. But so over 12 months, we'd keep pulling these tapes out, and and uh, you know, adding another little layer and color. And you know, what about that? You know, and we interesting thing about it. I almost got fired on this this job because, or Richard and I, because we couldn't get a, a drum sound. To, we couldn't figure out the secret of working at the record plant. The sounds were really, the studio was very dry and very tight. And so you had to really do a lot of work on the console to make the microphones find the sweet spot of the instruments. And So we spent five days working on this drum song and the drum sound uh, on a song called Keep Me There. It was Christine's song, and we couldn't we couldn't get it. We finally, in desperation, finally got the sound, and it, it's in the book. I won't repeat it, but so this song "Keep Me There" it was was amazing. That through, I mean, it was it, the song wasn't very good. I mean, we actually had this song that was what are we going to do? This, this dog. Uh, the only thing interesting about the song is right about halfway through, they went to like this breakdown, and John McVie played this bass line, boom, ba ba boom, ba 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 boom, boom. And then the, the whole band started doing a solo. Lindsay started playing a live solo. And this was live. I mean, this was just the way it came off on the, on the first take we took of it. Uh, so we used to try to, kept, we kept, kept trying to work on this song. And it was, this chorus was horrible. And, uh, Christine didn't know how to fix it. We were thought we were going to throw this away. On the 11th month, we, Lindsay comes in and he says, you know, Let's bring up Keep Me There again. And he says, I have this idea. He says, I think if we erase everything, he said, can erase everything, put blank tape in, in, and then cut it right up to that, to the bridge, to where the boom, 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 boom starts. And then we, he had Mick go out and play this. I mean, he, Lindsay had figured it all out in his head. It shows what a genius he is. He says, let's put down a kick drum. And so Mick went out and recorded this kick drum. 
you know, doom, doom. And then Lindsay says, okay, I gotta play an instrument. She says, what should I play? He started playing the guitar. No, that's not really the, with this right sound. And Lindsay had all these instruments. And we said, what about the dobro? Which is a steel, steel-faced guitar, so it's really got an edgy sound. And so I played the dobro, and here you got the dobro and the, um, and the, and the kick drum, and then he adds the bass to it. So at that point, they said, okay, now what are we gonna do with it? This, 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 we still didn't have really a great chorus. It was still Keep Me Their Chorus, but it sounded a lot better. Stevie had this song that she had, had been thinking about called The Chain, Chain Keep Me Together. And she says, well, I think it would work in that chorus. We could sing this stuff. So they go home and they all, they all get together and they all work on the, on the, uh, on the lyrics. And they come back and, it's the, and they, they sing the chain and the harmonies and all this stuff. And so they all got writer's credit. I think it's really interesting that that was the first song they recorded. Yep. The last song we finished and the only song they ever wrote together. You know, so it, it just, there was a thing that came together with this band and I think it was pretty miraculous. That is a great track. Damn the dark, damn the light, man. Those lyrics are amazing. Um, I know we're getting down the clock. So this record goes through, you know, you're in Sausalito for a while, you come back to LA, the band has to got, has doing shows, they're doing Day of the Green. A lot is going on during the year that it takes this record. At one point, and I don't know if we'll, we really have time to go into it, but at one point you realize the tapes have degraded to a, an extent, and um, through a little tech, uh, technical wizardry, you guys are able to kind of resurrect, using some safety masters, uh, resurrect the record. So it takes you a year to make this record that's gonna go on to be one of the biggest albums of all time. Your lives are changing, the band's lives are changing, money's beginning to come in, Christine McVie gets to buy a house, you got a new car, while, well, a new used car while you're in, a, in Sausalito. Things are changing. Um, the record that was already out, which they call, well, the fans call it the White Album, not the Beatles' White Album, but this was Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac, which was album 10, has now gone gangbusters. Two big hits, so in the year that you started to the year that it was released, Fleetwood Mac, a band you had not even heard of, has now become very famous, making a lot of money, playing giant arenas, and your um, status has elevated quite a lot as well. You will go on, you and Richard, to win um, Grammys for this, which you had predicted or aspired to from the very beginning, and this was the first record you ever produced. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even hired as a producer. I was hired as an engineer, but they said, you know, your contributions are much more than an engineer. So they said, they actually called us in the room one day and said, you guys are fired. And we had, <laughs> we started laughing because it was like, we were, so, we were dead tired. We've been working 14 hour days, 15 hour days. And so like, there's no way you're gonna fire us. I mean, you can't. You can't get people like the like us. They said, "Okay, we're we're kidding. We're kidding. We're actually going to give you producers credit on this thing." So we didn't know what that meant. They didn't know that it meant we were going to get a couple cents for every record that's ever sold. You know, mm -hmm. but but uh, yeah. Suddenly I was a producer, and suddenly suddenly everybody wanted it. me and Richard. I mean, when I say me, I usually I forget to say Richard. So I mean, we were in demand, and it was yeah. it was. Suddenly there was women, there were cars, there was money, and the- More of everything. More of everything. If you look at this man's discography, I mean, my God, it's, it looks like there's a few hundred albums on there that you've been involved with. And um, since then, you've gone on to form your own companies. You have your lovely daughter, Colby Calais. She has gone on to be a successful artist in her own right, and I believe win a couple of Grammys. Mm -hmm. um, you produced mm -hmm. her first and second album, correct? Or, I think first, the first four records. The first four records, yeah. oh, all four. And um, I mean, you're living the American rock and roll dream, my brother. I get, I get paid to listen to music, you know, it's so it's great. fantastic. So tell me what's going on with you now, because just to wrap up the rumors thing, please buy the book, it's Making Rumors. And uh, it'll give you all the, if you're wanting the dirt, there's a little bit in there too. I'm not gonna go into all that, but so these days, here's the other thing I wanted to get from you, because Man, you've seen it all by this point. I mean, you were in the music business in the golden age when bands sold out 
football stadiums and you had a year to make a record and people made money and record stores existed and we actually had music on a hard media. Yep. Listen, man, it's, I can think of one record store in Los Angeles right now. And it's a shame. I spent my entire childhood in record stores. Yeah, so did I. So, so now, 2015, here in a matter of days, Apple Music's going to come out. And I'm an Apple fanboy, I admit. But where do we go from here? I mean, w w streaming seems to not pay very well to the artists and the people who create the records. Um, what happens now, do you think? Well, you think I'm sm smart or something. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, what I do think, is the, the problem is that people have stopped listening on speakers primarily. There's a lot of earbuds. And, and you know, and, and the other thing is, you di and I get the digital downloads. I, you know, that's fine. I, I don't want to go to the store. And right. my daughter doesn't want to even go, want to go to the store to buy something. She'd rather sure. download it. But when you download it, I, let's say I just downloaded a record. It doesn't feel any heavier. It doesn't feel any different. Huh, how much is that worth? The, you know, the perceived value and the fact that you don't share it with anybody else. I, I think that the television industry has done such a great job of promoting visuals, 3D, bigger screens. And, and I think the audio industry needs to start promoting speakers. You know, at least you can sit there and listen. I mean, I used to bring my, my girlfriend over to my house to listen on my speakers, right? It was partly an excuse, right? But, sure. But, right. hey, you know, it was great fun. So... But now you don't share the music, you don't look at the album covers, uh, you know, so streaming, streaming isn't gonna work. It, it works for a lot of people because a lot of people have, don't think they should pay for very much, um, very much for music. You know, my daughter cost about $40,000 to make one song, on average, you know. I mean, you can do a lot cheaper, but typically, you know, with everything else in there and the, the artwork and the photo shoot and the, you know, it's probably $40,000. And she always says to me, Dad, do you, do, why do you think People think it's not worth a cup of coffee. It's less than a cup. I mean, they, you know, Starbucks coffee, what, three ninety nine? Yeah. And people got no problem paying that, but they won't pay for a forty thousand dollars song. The dollar twenty nine for song is just too much. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, you make an interesting point because I had never thought about the actual tangible aspect of it, but I do remember as a kid, you know, buying an album, opening it up, reading the liner notes, pulling out the goodies if there was a poster or whatever it was, and you know. My wife laughs at me, but yeah, I was the guy who kept all my records, you know, um, immaculate. Today, my daughter buys records, but she doesn't even have a record player. She buys them as kind of memorabilia, and she puts them on her wall. Mm -hmm. um, she wants to download her music, but the other point is, they, you mentioned the thing that you're not listening to it on speakers. You're also not listening to it as an album. You're listening to it as a, a song at a time, which I think further kind of diminishes this perceived value of the art form. Yeah, and, and if you make the analogy going back to television, that would be like watching a segment of, of a sitcom bef between the commercials. I, yeah. It, it kind of doesn't make a sense to me that people, I still, when I make a record, I still typically make 10 songs and I work, I, I labor hard over the running order. What song starts off, what song goes next. Of course. And, you know, and trying to keep it as an, an emotional kind of enjoyable ride, just in case you, people did listen to the whole thing. I still buy whole records. If I'm going to buy one song, I'd buy the whole thing. I, I want to hear what they have to say, you know. I, I agree. I mean, and sometimes I buy records just, to, well, buy downloads just to support an artist that I like. I mean, I bought the last Brian Ferry album, and um, I like Brian Ferry, but I also I wanted to give the guy my money mm -hmm. for still making records at this point in time. and. Um, yeah, the, the idea that music should be free, unfortunately, it's a, it's a thing that, I don't know if we'll ever be able to shake that because people have changed, or expectations have changed, but it's certainly worth uh, money, and, and kudos to Taylor Swift for, for calling out Apple on this deal, because guess what, they buckle to Taylor Swift. Yeah. So right on. So one of the last things I want to talk about that you told me th that you're doing, and, um, and I think this is great, because I have daughters, I hope that they will continue to be involved in art, and you are creating kind of a school for young artists. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, it was interesting that when my daughter uh, wrote her first song, Bubbly, she, she had not been performing. She just wrote the song at home because I had been teaching her how to write songs. She wrote the song, and, and her, her friend 
posted it on MySpace, and it went completely bonkers. It went viral. She had 20 million fans. It's just crazy. I mean, she was on the cover of, of uh, was it Rolling Stone? It was, she was called the queen of digital. And, and so the record company is going, we got to get this girl out on the road. You mm -hmm. know, we're going to make a fortune. And off they sent her. And I had to run down to the guitar store, get a guitar tuner, get a reverb unit, show her how to tune guitars. And, and she, had, she was not prepared for anything. And so I realized, and, and then we, we ended up hiring uh, an image consultant who would go there and help her get comfortable because she was very nervous on stage. Sure. So an image consultant, we would work with her on her clothes and her, her you know, the patter to the audience, the, the pacing of talking to people because she would sometimes just say thank you and then, you know, so she wasn't an entertainer and there's a big difference between an artist and an entertainer, a singer and an entertainer. So anyway, I, I thought this whole thing with m my daughter is exactly what everybody needs. There should be these group of professional people, image consultants, vocal coaches, stylists, uh, that, that you can go to and, uh, and become, I, I like to say, um, smooth out the uh, road of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. You know, take out the bumps of that. So we've created this school, um, and it's basically, a, right, right now initially, a weekend workshop where I've got the top, I've got Beyonce's uh, image co coach, I've got uh, um, um, another really great vocal coach, I've got stylists, I've got clothing people, and they come, and these artists will come, aspiring artists will come and actually wor work on camera, because there's a whole thing of how do you work with the camera, you've got to know, you know, you've got to be personable, you've got to, you know, and, and it all starts, it starts with a basic foundation. If you don't have, if your guitar is a piece of crap, if it's not in tune, if you don't have a guitar tuner, you know it, and you're going to be not yourself. You know, if you yeah, you're just not going to be putting your A game out. But if you if you know you're looking good and you got the right equipment, you're going to have a heck of a better chance to blow the doors off. You know your performance. So we've created this. Uh, it's called Los Angeles um, Performing Arts Center, mm -hmm. and it's going to be uh, here in Los Angeles. But it's the top people. I call them mentors in the business. Over now, together. right now, it's just a weekend thing. Right now, it's, thing. it's, 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 a, it's called Artist Max. It's a weekend, okay. September 18th, 1920, in the famous uh, Village Recording Studio where we recorded okay. the Tusk album. Yeah. So we'll have 50 to 100 students coming in, and uh, we're actually uh, partnered with Reverb Nation. So they're offering it to their 2 to 3 million uh, um, subscribers, subscribers and listeners. Yeah. That is excellent because... These days, I mean, you've got to be on top of it from the get-go. I mean, there are still bands that jump in the van and do it that way, but these days, I mean, it seems more like you need to be almost ready to go out of the can. Right. And I, I, I talked to bands, and there was an older band, I mean, a guy that, he's in his 50s, and I said, you, so I'm sure you've got all the right tools. You have in-ear in -ear monitors so you can hear yourself right. And I said, none of us do have do. I said, how's that working for you? He goes, well, sometimes we, you know, it's cool, but we, it works sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't work. So sometimes it doesn't work. Well, when those when that doesn't work for the audience, what do you think they say? You know, mm -hmm. you have to have it work every time, mm -hmm. and you need to have your drummer play to a click so he plays consistently. And it, the biggest thing about live is that, uh, you know, if you if you get nervous or insecure, usually the musicians start playing louder, yeah. and playing faster. So, you know, then the performance you know flies off the sh uh, flies off wrong direction and. Uh, so I just say, you know, get get the basics done. You know, have yourself perfect. And there's a great place like Guitar Center, have all the right tools, so there's it's no excuse. That's true. No. Um, well, I, I look forward to checking it out. I might bring my daughters down to take a look at that if they continue to be interested. Today we've been speaking with Ken Calais. His book is Making Rumors, the inside story behind the making of Fleetwood Mac's rumors. I love the record. I love the work that you guys all did. And um, like I say, I mean, this is something that's going to live forever. It's, uh, if somebody were to come up to me and say, Michael, you know what, I, I don't really like rumors. I don't even think I could take them seriously. I mean, it's like such a good record, and uh, it's hard to imagine anyone disliking it. Ken, thank you so much for coming right. on. I Thanks. really appreciate nice this. And uh, you guys, this has been episode 16 of Antidote. Next week we will have the Honorable Paul Hellyer, uh, former Canadian uh, Minister of Defense, on the show. That's going to be very interesting. So until next week... You, me, all of us together, we are the antidote.